foreign place requires that we learn to live in a different way. For instance, driving. Let's say you grew up in rural Pennsylvania and you learned to drive here. You learned the official traffic laws, but you also learned informal driver etiquette. How to interact with other drivers. You learned to watch for deer and possum. You learned how to pass an Amish buggy and how to navigate a wet, curvy road that hugged the bends of the creek. Let's say you learned your lessons well and were considered a pretty good driver. But then, let's say you moved. And you moved from here to Washington, D.C. or Boston or L.A. Heavy traffic, crowded highways, one-way streets, construction everywhere, substantial police activity and traffic jams from Monday through Friday, all over the place. Now the rules of the road may not have changed, but the informal etiquette certainly has. You would have to learn to drive in a very different way. Traffic reports would suddenly become very important to you. Courteous driving may re be replaced with aggressive or very defensive driving techniques. How to pull out on a high-speed highway filled with traffic and to navigate around an accident while rubbernecking safely would be a skill that you would have to develop. But let's go further. Let's say instead of Washington, D.C. or L.A. or Boston, let's say you move to London. Now, not only has the informal traffic etiquette changed, and not only have you moved from a rural to an urban environment, but now the rules of the road have changed. Try driving downtown in London like you learned to drive in rural Pennsylvania and there are going to be major problems. First off, because you're driving on the wrong side of the road. And other drivers will let you know that. But let's go further. Instead of moving to London, let's say you move to Beijing. Now, not only have you moved from the rural to the urban, not only have you moved from one country to another, where the laws and the traffic laws and the etiquette are all different, but also, the language has changed, and everything about your situation has changed. Cars are different. Signs are all written in Chinese. You can't read the gauges on your dashboard. Men, you will really have a good excuse for not pulling over and asking directions because you don't speak Mandarin. So you couldn't understand it even if they gave them to you. Now try following your GPS as it tells you you missed your turn and it's recalculating in Chinese. Now driving is only one aspect one aspect of our lives. When you move to a foreign place like Beijing, all sorts of things change in life. Food changes drastically. Shopping, renting or purchasing a home, how to pay your bills, opening a bank account, finding a job, going to school. The list could go on and on and on. All sorts of things have changed, and the first thing that you would need to do is learn to speak Mandarin Chinese. And you'd also have to learn how to eat with chopsticks. And, I hope nobody is offended by this, but you'd also have to learn how to use the squatty potty. Because that's life in Beijing. When you move to a foreign place, all sorts of things that you would never even think about change. And it is necessary that you change in order to survive and make it in that new place. In the second half of Romans chapter 6, Paul has been using a series of interrelated analogies with contrasting elements to help us understand how sanctification works. Remember, sanctification is the process of learning how to act like God. We have been saved by God's grace through no works of our own. He has moved in our hearts to bring about belief in Him and a relationship with Jesus Christ. God is the one who does all the work in our salvation. Then begins the process of sanctification. And that's acting more and more like God. Justification is being made righteous. Sanctification is learning to act like it. And that's where we have to exert effort. That's where we're work, our work comes into play. Salvation is monogistic. That's one, mono, one energy, one person acting. That's God. Sanctification, on the other hand, is synergistic. 
Two energies coming together, working together, us and God working together hand in hand to bring about change. God alone does all the work to justify us when he saves us, but we work together with God in the sanctification process. We are instantly justified and made right with God by his declaration when we are saved. But sanctification is a long process, slow development, and it takes time in which we make progress. We learn and we grow, and sometimes we make mistakes, we lose ground, and then we learn from our mistakes, and we grow with God's grace, by God's grace, and continue in that lifelong process, learning and growing and making our mistakes and learning from them and growing, and by God's grace, learning some more, moving in the right direction. Each of the eight analogies of contrast that Paul uses here in chapter 6 shed light on that process of sanctification and how it works. The first one we looked at a couple weeks ago was that unbelievers use their body parts for sinful purposes. Believers are learning to use their body parts to accomplish that which glorifies God. Paul, Paul contrasts the way an unbeliever and believer use their body parts. Today, Paul shows us that sanctification, sanctification is like living in a new place, a contrast of position, one place to another. Listen again to Romans 6.14. Sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Today's contrast is a contrast of position. We're in a new place. When we were unbelievers, we lived under law. Those who believe in Jesus now live under grace. It's like we have moved into a new realm. We live in a new place. We're experiencing a new culture. We're living in a new setting with new influences and new expectations. So the question we want to ask today is what does it mean to be under law and what does it mean to be under grace? Under law. To live in the place called under law means that you live in a land based on rules. It's a penal colony like a prison. A place where if you step out of line, you experience punishment. It's a place of fear. It's a place of confinement. In the land of under law, there are no rewards. The best that we can hope for is to avoid punishment. A person living under law abides by the rules out of fear of that punishment, knowing eventually they will break the rules and punishment will happen. They hope, their only hope, is to hold off as long as possible, to keep the punishment at bay as long as possible. Their highest goal of those living under law is to make life tolerable. Under law is a hard place to live. It's a dark place to live. The residents are always trying to figure out how to escape punishment. Under law, a person must focus on themselves. It's a selfish place. It's a lonely place. Under law is a bleak and dirty and desperate place. And that's where every person on the face of the planet begins life. As descendants of Adam, the father of all lawbreakers, we are his children, lawbreakers, living under law. From the moment we are conceived in our mother's womb, we live in the prison called under law. Apart from Christ, all people continue to live under law. And all the people will continue to live under law so long as they remain apart from Christ, both in this world and the next. Muslims live under law. Jews without Christ live under law. Buddhists and Hindus live under law. Atheists and agnostics live under law. Cults, those who worship science, those who worship celebrities, those who worship money, fame, power, politics, sex, pleasure, food, all live under law. Anyone who values anything more than Christ is living under law because the things that they value more than Christ are their idols that they worship. So long as we continue to live apart from Christ, we live under law. But when we come to Christ, he brings us to a new place, a different place, a better place, a place called under grace. What does it mean to live under grace? How is it different from living under law? Where law has rules and fear, grace has to do with love 
and favor. The word grace literally means unmerited favor. It's favor that we don't deserve. It's approval that we didn't earn. It's reward that we didn't win. In other words, it's not based on what we do. Grace is God's approval regardless of how well we follow or fail to follow the rules. Under grace is a land where God loves you and blesses you eternally despite the fact that the residents don't deserve it. Law is a prison colony behind locked bars. Grace has open doors. Law is a place of punishment and what was, where punishment is always imminent because of failure. Grace is a place of where punishment is removed. Law is a place of fear. Grace is a place of peace. Law is a place where following the rules is done, dreading the consequences of failing to uh, accomplish the rules. Grace is a land filled with hope. Law, uh, the greatest hope in the land of law is to avoid breaking the law, to avoid the punishment that accompanies that. Grace is a land filled with hope because Every action done in the land of grace is cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Breaking the law is cleansed and removed. All law abiding is blessed and celebrated, and all law breaking is forgiven. Law is a place where people act out of fear, and the fear of the judge drives them. Grace is a place where love of the Father motivates them. Fear of the judge drives, love of the Father motivates. So while under law is a hard place, a dark place, a selfish place, a lonely place, a bleak and dirty place, a desperate place, under grace is a warm, a selfless community, a warm place, bright, hopeful, filled with love, relationships, support, nurturing, caring, a good place, a clean place. While every person starts under law, not every person ends under grace. Adam was the father of those who are under the law, and that means everyone. But Christ is the father of those under grace, and that means some. That means those who are in Christ. That means not everyone. Adam is the father of everyone. Christ is the father of those who believe in him. So while we are born into the land of under law, we must be born again into the land of under grace. And that happens only when we come to know Jesus as our personal Lord. That term means master, and that's the term that Paul is using in this passage, and Savior. As Savior, we are forgiven and declared right by God. As Lord, we learn to behave in righteous ways. Christ is our Savior, and he declares us right. Christ is our Lord, and he teaches us how to live. That's, the, that's what the process of sanctification is all about. If punishment is removed, if punishment is removed and law-breaking is forgiven, won't everyone who lives under grace wantonly disregard the law and break the law flagrantly? That's the, the fear of those who live under law. That's the interpretation of things by those who live under law. They say, since there is no punishment, what will stop people from sinning? That's the conclusion that people who live under law draw. Since their motivation is fear, they believe that when fear is removed, lawlessness will flood into the land. And that's why Paul asks the question in verse 15. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning because we are not under law but under grace? And what is his answer? By no means. Absolutely not. God forbid. No way. Impossible. Why not? Because people live in a new place, is his answer. One of eight answers that he gives here. But this is one today that we're looking at. Because people live in a new place. The old reasoning doesn't work anymore. The old way of doing things doesn't work anymore. Things have so drastically changed that the old motivations are no longer needed for people to learn to live in the new way. Fear is no longer necessary to make people obey the laws. People living under grace will not see their new position as a means to sin greatly. They will see it as an opportunity to obey mightily. People living in grace will not see their new position to sin greatly, but to 
uh, obey my rule. Not because they fear the judge, but because they love the Father. True Christians don't try to live their lives out of fear of judgment, but out of a desire to honor their eternal Father. It's joy that motivates the Christian, not despair that drives the unbeliever. That's the difference. Everything has changed. This is a new and foreign place. Everything has changed. If you're in Christ, you've left the land of under law, and you're now living in the land of under grace. Under grace has many different cultural expectations, like a holy lifestyle, living your life in a different way. Under grace has a new mindset, a holy mindset, holy thinking. Grace is a new language, holy speech, holy speaking, speech that honors God. Not only telling the truth, but also challenging and encouraging other believers to follow their faith more greatly. Telling others about the new land. Evangelism. Why? Why? Would these people do this? Because it's a beautiful land. First of all, it's a wonderful land. It's an inspiring land. Under grace is a land that is free from fear and filled with hope. Under grace is a land that is bright and clean and invigorating and empowering. There are many people who still live in the dirty hovel of under law, paying rent to a sleazy landlord who's overcharging them to keep them in their ghetto in moral poverty and ethical slums. Right around the corner, however, right around the corner is a clean home, free home, open to all who would come in, filled with beauty, without gates, on, without locks on the gate, filled with beauty, grace, light, and the love of the Father. It's a land called under grace. Now let me ask you something. If you knew someone who was living in a dirty, rat-filled, cockroach-ridden hovel that was draining the life from them and their children, you'd want to do something about it, wouldn't you? Especially if you knew of a place, a vacancy, in a rent-free, clean, empowering home filled with love and respect and support. You'd want to tell that person, wouldn't you, about the place that they could go? You might even want to show them where it is. You might even want to help them to get there. You might even want to take your car and help them to move in. You might try with great effort to convince them about how much better life could be in that new, clean environment. Wouldn't you want to do that? What if that person that was living in the dirty hovel was a friend of yours or a family member? Could you just stand by and let them live in squalor, suffering? Or would you do everything in your power to get them to move from the dirty place where they were living, the unhealthy environment where their children were being raised, into the clean environment of a healthy, um, clean, nurturing, supportive environment? What would you do to get them to move? There are many people who are today living in a dirty, terrible, downtrodden place. It's not a physical place, though. It's a spiritual place. It's a place that affects them to their very soul, that affects them to their very core. How much more should we want to help somebody? If we are willing and eager to help somebody move physically from a dirty place to a clean place, how much more spiritually? Because a dirty place here on earth is temporary. It's going to end someday. But a dirty place spiritually will go on forever and ever. So how much more should we be motivated to help somebody who's living in a dirty place spiritually, who's suffering in this life is only the beginning, of the suffering that they will experience eternally because they're living in a land of under law, not under grace. If you're living under grace, the fear has left your heart and your spirit, and the joy has replaced it. And you have actually come to the place where it is impossible for you to resist telling others about the land of under grace. It is impossible for you to resist be wanting to tell people about the joy that you're experiencing because you've moved from the dirty, hobble, sleazy, terrible place of under law to the wonderful, joyful, light filled place of under grace. If you're truly a Christian, it is hard to resist.
resist that impulse and there's nothing in you that makes you want to resist the impulse to tell somebody, hey, there's a better place right around the corner. If, on the other hand, if you're not excited about living under grace, it's because you don't really know what it means like, what it feels like to live under grace. You haven't experienced it yet. Because once you've tasted and experienced the good life of under grace with the Father, the desire to honor the Father by bringing others into His home and living the holy life here on earth will become your desire and your destiny. On this Father's Day, you will honor your Heavenly Father as you live under His grace and draw others to live there too. Moving out from under law, moving into under grace. That's sanctification. It's a new place. It's a place of eternal desire for God, and it's a place of destiny for believers. Let's pray. Father,